This is a radiation detector called a Geiger-Muller counter. It makes a beeping sound when radiation is detected. This is a radiation source, which is an encapsulated piece of artificially created material that emits radiation. Let's place the radiation source in front of the detector. You can see that the source is emitting radiation frequently. What happens if we move the radiation source away from the detector? The reason why the detector sounds even when there is no radiation source is because radiation exists in nature. Radiation was discovered by the German physicist Röntgen. Röntgen noticed that a film placed near a discharge tube would turn black even though no light was shining on it. He thought that something new, invisible, was coming out of the discharge tube. He named it X-rays, meaning something unknown. It turns out that X-rays have a greater ability to penetrate matter than light. X-rays are artificial radiation, but it is now known that there are other types of radiation in nature. Research at the time revealed that radiation is emitted from naturally occurring ores. This was the discovery of a new type of radiation, different from X-rays. Mr. and Mrs. Curie succeeded in extracting the elements that emit radiation from ores. Minerals, or rocks, and stones, are found everywhere. Therefore, radiation can be found anywhere in nature. Quantum mechanics was necessary to understand radiation. The discovery of radiation led to nuclear physics and particle physics. There are many different types of radiation. I'm sure you have heard of alpha rays, beta rays, gamma rays, and X-rays. Alpha rays are high-speed helium nuclei emanating from atomic nuclei. Beta rays are fast electrons emitted from atomic nuclei. At the same time, anti-electron neutrinos are emitted. Gamma rays are high-energy photons emitted by atomic nuclei. X-rays are photons emitted by atoms, and are probably the most familiar form of radiation to everyone. As our understanding of radiation has deepened, applications have begun to take advantage of its properties. The penetrating power of X-rays is being used for non-destructive inspections. This picture was taken by Röntgen himself. Other applications include baggage inspections at airports and X-ray examinations at medical institutions. Crystal structures are analyzed using the phenomenon of X-ray diffraction. We can see the crystal structure of a new compound. Image analysis is possible by using a technique that reconstructs where the radiation was emitted. When combined well with chemical substances, it can be used for cancer screening. Radiation is also useful in treatment. Radiation is used to kill cancer cells by irradiating them. We have mentioned some examples of the use of radiation but we need to be careful when handling radiation. The advantages of radiation are its high energy and its ability to penetrate matter. However, this advantage of radiation is also a disadvantage. Radiation has a great impact on living organisms and can affect a wide range of areas. Therefore, radiation needs to be used in a controlled manner. It is important to stop radiation efficiently, in other words, to shield it. Let me explain the theme of this experiment. In this experiment, we will be using gamma rays. Gamma rays have a particularly high penetrating power among all types of radiation. We will investigate the interaction between gamma rays and materials. Specifically, we measure the absorption coefficient. The absorption coefficient is a physical quantity that is the basis of radiation shielding. Next, we will discuss the interaction between gamma rays and materials. There are three main types of interactions. The photoelectric effect is a phenomenon in which gamma rays are absorbed by atoms, causing electrons in the atoms to pop out. 
Compton scattering is the scattering of gamma rays and electrons. After a gamma ray hits an electron, it changes direction and the electron is ejected. The gamma ray loses some of its energy. Electron-positron pair production is a phenomenon in which gamma rays are lost and electrons and positrons are produced by the Coulomb field created by the atomic nucleus. Here is the equipment used in this experiment. This is a radiation source that emits gamma rays. The material that emits the radiation is sealed and safe, but please handle it with care. Please receive it directly from the instructor when you use it. This is G, a GG detector, used to detect gamma rays. This is the control unit of the detector. We will explain how to use it later. Absorber plate to absorb gamma rays. There are two types, copper and lead. Put on gloves when you handle lead. Be careful not to touch the lead with bare hands. The following is an explanation of the principle of the experiment. First, I will explain the principle of the detector. When gamma rays enter the scintillator, the scintillator emits light, and the photodiode, that receives the light, outputs a small signal. When this signal is passed through an amplifier, it becomes a larger signal. The size of the output signal is related to the amount of energy transferred to the scintillator by the incident gamma rays. The detector has two modes. Disk and SCA. The signals are sorted according to the wave height, threshold E, and the interval of the wave height, delta E. First, let's discuss the disk mode. It is a mode that sorts signals by discrete, or threshold. All pulses that exceed the threshold are counted. SCA mode counts only the signals in the range of delta E above the threshold. It does not count signals that are smaller or larger than this range. These two modes are used in different ways to perform the experiment. Let's measure the energy spectrum. This section describes the settings of the controller. This is the switch to set SCA or disk mode as explained earlier. Set to disk mode. Do not place any source or shielding plate in front of the detector. The threshold value is set by this dial, which is labeled discrete. Such a dial is called a helipot. Let me explain how to use it. When the dial is turned once, the number in the square window goes up by 1. The number in the square window is 1's place, and the scale of the dial represents the value after decimal point. Since the number in the square window is 1 and the dial is 35, the value at this time is 1.35. For the background measurement, set the helipot to 0. Now we are ready to measure. Now let's start the measurement by pressing the start button. At beginning, the value will rise vigorously. As you turn the helipot, the numbers on the display board will gradually change more slowly. When the number of counts per second reaches a few times, stop turning the helipod and record the helipod value at that time. In this case, it is about 1.35. To make it a round number, round it up to the first decimal place and set it to 1.4. Place the source snugly in front of the detector. Switch from disk mode to SCA mode. This is the switch to change the unit of the measurement time between seconds and minutes, where SEC is seconds and MIN is minutes. Set it to minutes. These two dials are used to set the measurement time. The left side represents the tens place, and the right side represents the ones place. The dials have arrows on them. Read the number that the arrow is pointing at. In this example, it is set to 0 and 3 which means 3 minutes. For this measurement, turn the dial to set it to 2 minutes. Set the delta E setting. The delta E setting is made at the helipod on the back of the detector control unit. Set it to 
Delta E is now set to 0.1. Press the start button to start the measurement. After each measurement, increase the helipot's value by 0.1. Increase the value of discrete by 0.1, and repeat the measurement. At first, the counting rate will decrease gradually, but at some point, it will start to increase. If you continue, the counting rate will start decreasing again, and finally it will become almost zero. End the measurement there. We have obtained the number of counts, C for the range from E to E plus delta E, by measuring while changing the threshold, E. Next, calculate the error, delta C, of the counts. The error, delta C, is the root C. Make a graph with E plus one half of delta E on the horizontal axis, and counts, C, on the vertical axis. Also fill in the error bars. This graph is an example of measurement results. Below the peak area, there is supposed to be a background. Estimate the amount of background by assuming a linear background shape. Subtract the background from the number of counts C. After subtracting the background, the graph should look like this. Apply the Gaussian function to this graph by eyes and estimate the full width at half maximum and the centroid. The full width at half maximum is the horizontal width of the peak at the height of a half value of the peak maximum. The next experiment is to measure the absorption coefficient. There is also natural radiation, and it is called background radiation. First, we will measure the background count rate. Do not place any source or shielding plate in front of the detector. Change the mode back to disk mode. Set the measurement time to 10 minutes. Set the threshold value to the value of the valley in the graph drawn in the energy spectrum measurement. In this example, the value is 2.3. So we set the helipot of the discrete to that value. After 10 minutes of measurement, record the measured background counts. Place the detector and the source with their centers aligned. You may want to put a piece of graph paper underneath them to make use of the scale. The distance should be 3 cm apart. Measure while changing the thickness of the absorber. Measure with two different metals, copper and lead. Combine several types of plates to get the thickness you want. Set the measurement time to 3 minutes, and start measuring. After 3 minutes of measurement, record the measured counts. Repeat this process for each thickness. When the measurement is finished, determine the background count rate, NB, and its error, delta NB, from the background count measured at the beginning. Next, the counting rate, N, is obtained from the counts measured while changing the thickness, X, of the absorber. From this count rate, N, we subtract the background count rate, NB. We also calculate the error. Draw a graph where the horizontal axis is the thickness of the absorber, X, and the vertical axis is N minus NB, as calculated earlier, with the error bars attached. Note that we will be using a semi-log graph. After plotting, fit a straight line by eyes and estimate the absorption coefficient mu, from the slope. Please summarize these in your report. Please read the textbook for more details.